of the Lord. Hallelujah. We are all welcome to this service. Um, I want us to get ready for a shift because the word of God coming to us is alive and active. And the Bible says it pierces to the dividing asunder of spirit and soul. According to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, the word of God has real practical impact upon our lives. And therefore, it has to be taken seriously, even as we discuss it in this service. Please, if you understand what I'm saying, shout hallelujah. I'm speaking in this service on what I've captioned be a servant of God. It's a divine injunction. Be a servant of God. And our anchor passage is Psalm 89 and verse 20. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. I'm speaking on the subject, be a servant of God. Somebody shout with me, I am a servant of God. To serve simply means to carry out the wishes of another. When we talk about service or being a servant, a servant is someone who carries out the wishes of another. A servant is someone who pursues and achieves the interests of another person. The interests of another person. And when we talk about us being servants of God, then it is a call for us to carry out the wishes of God. It is a call for us to pursue the interests of our God. 
And serving God should be the desire of every wise-hearted Christian. Serving God should be the desire of every wise-hearted believer. In other words, it is important for every child of God to seek to be a servant of God. It is important for every child of God to seek to be a servant of God. And that is the decision that Joshua made. He made up his mind to serve the Lord his God. Joshua 24 and verse number 15. Joshua 24 and verse number 15. The last part of that verse he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. It should be the desire of every child of God to serve the Lord Jesus. And in doing this now, please, I need to emphasize this again and again. In doing this, you don't need to be called a pastor, an apostle, an evangelist, or a bishop. You don't have to be called any of those titles, if you like, for you to be a servant of God. For you to be a servant of God. If you understand that, shout hallelujah. The meaning is, no matter your profession, you can be a servant of God. Are you an accountant? You can be a servant of God. Are you a lawyer? You can be a servant of God. It doesn't matter your profession. There is nothing that should stop you from serving God. As we have said before, the Bible is littered with examples of men and women that were not necessarily pastors. They were professionals in various fields and yet God called them his servants. One of them is Caleb. Let's look at some of these examples. Example number one of people in the Bible who were not necessarily called bishops apostles and what have you and yet they were servants of God number one Caleb numbers chapter 14 and verse number 24 but here it is my servant Caleb have you seen that God called Caleb his servant and he was not a prophet he was not an apostle he was not called bishop or general superintendent no no this guy, Caleb, was just a professional soldier, and yet he served God. Don't tell me I'm in the military so I cannot be a servant of God. Uh -uh. Caleb was a military man now, but he served God. God himself called him my servant. He said, my servant, Caleb. Somebody shout hallelujah. How about Moses? Moses was an equivalent of a head of state over Israel. And yet, he was a servant of God. God called him so. He talked about my servant Moses. Joshua chapter 1, for example, and verse number 1. Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 1. After the death of Moses, oh my God. The servant of the Lord. Moses was what, sir? The servant of the Lord. Please, be a servant of God regardless of your profession. An accountant, an engineer, an architect, a footballer, <laughs> or netballer, or volleyballer. <laughs> It doesn't matter your area of profession. You must be a servant of God. Do his bidding. Carry out his interests. Do what pleases him. He said, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, verse number two. He said, 
Moses, my servant, is dead. This is God now talking direct to Joshua. He says, Moses, my servant. Yes. Moses, my servant. As you look at yourself as an accountant, please allow God to also look at you as his servant. Do his bidding. Carry out his interests. What are some of the channels that we can employ to be servants of God? That we can employ as servants of God? That we can utilize to serve God? Let us look at some of the channels of service that are crucially important for us. Number one, carrying out the work of evangelism. One of the simplest ways of turning yourself into a servant of God is to carry out the work of evangelism. Carry out the work of evangelism. We must carry out the work of evangelism. It is the personal obligation of every child of God to win souls to Christ. If you are a recipient of the Holy Spirit, you are under obligation to witness for Christ. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. Yes. You shall be witnesses to me. You shall be witnesses. Those that have received the power of the Holy Spirit are under obligation to witness for Christ. And if you're a child of God, you are a recipient of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you are under compassion to win souls to Christ. Luke 14 and verse number 23 in that parable, the master said to his servants, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. You can become a servant of God by carrying out the work of evangelism. And you don't need to be called any title for you to win souls to Christ. Please, right in your neighborhood where you live, there are so many people that need Jesus. The moment you begin talking to them, about Jesus and helping them to receive him as Lord and personal savior. You are already serving God. You are a servant of God. People may not call you anything, but you are a servant of God. Hallelujah. I would rather not be given any title, but I must serve God. Because it is not title that serves God. There are so many people that are called prophets, bishops, that are not servants of God. Because I told you who a servant is. A servant is someone who carries out the interests of another. And do you know, you can do ministry as a pastor and not serve the interests of God, but your own interests. It's there in the Bible now. Not everyone who is called these names is a servant of God. Pastor. They can give you some bigger title than pastor. Maybe general superintendent. Or chief apostle. But that is not what makes you a servant of God. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21 going into 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father. Have you seen that? What he is calling the will of his father is simply talking about the interests and the wishes of my father. You can do many things, but is it the will of God? Yes. So look at verse 22. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Ah! I thought I was prophesying as a servant of God. I said, no. You are carrying out your own interests. You are carrying big title, but you are not my servant. So don't be intoxicated with names and titles. 
Hey, if they want me to win souls, then they must give me a title. You don't need title. Just go ahead and do his bidding. Carry out the interests of God. And I'm saying one particular area of interest for God is evangelism. So you can become a servant of God by simply carrying out the work of evangelism. Please, if you understand that, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Number two. How else can I serve God? Number two. Now hear this. Through what I'm calling spiritual gifts and talents utilization in the promotion of the work of God. Spiritual gifts and talents utilization in the promotion of the work of God. Spiritual gifts and talents utilization in the promotion of the work of God. Each one of us has been endowed with spiritual gifts and talents. When you begin to employ your talents, abilities, competencies, skills, and gifts in the promotion of the work of God, you're already serving God. It may not be anything spiritual. It doesn't have to. For example, if you're an electrician and you say, Pastor, every time you have problems with barbs, I will be fixing them. You are a servant of God. Is it making sense? Yes. It doesn't have to be anything spiritual like intercession. <laughs> no. Anything you do in the utilization of your abilities, gifts and talents for the promotion of the work of God is already a service to God. And everyone who is rendering a service to God is a servant of God. And so in your Bible, you'll see in Exodus 31, verses 1 to 6. Exodus 31, verses 1 to 6. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, now here it is, verse 2. Now, God had commissioned Moses to build him what the Bible calls the tabernacle the tent of meeting. And in this passage, God is giving Moses details of people appointed and endowed supernaturally with skills that would be needed in the construction project. And so he says in verse number two, see, I have called by by name Bezalel, the son of, U of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And here it is, I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Can I have this verse in the New Living Translation or Good News Translation? It says, I have filled him, here it is, with the spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He was endowed supernaturally, but we also get these things through education, isn't it? Yes. I have given him architectural skills supernaturally, but today we go to school for those. So, these abilities I'm talking about can be supernaturally endowed or can be educationally acquired. You acquire them through education and training. Whichever way those skills have come to you, always find ways and means of employing them for the promotion of the work of God. Is it making sense? Yes. Verse number four says he is a master craftsman. Expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. Verse number five. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in curving wood. He is a master at every craft. And that is Bezalel for you. 
a master at every craft. Now the good news is that you are a master at some particular craft. Now use that mastery for the promotion of the work of God. He says, all this he must use in the construction work. And it was not his personal project. It was God's project. So Bezalel, therefore, was a servant of God in this sense. He never had spectacular encounters with God like Moses had. No, Moses was also a servant of God in his own right. Bezalel also, in this regard, was a servant of God. Number three, channels of serving God. Number one, carrying out the work of evangelism. Number two, spiritual gifts and talents utilization in the promotion of the work of God. And I'm saying in this regard that you must always find ways of using what you are good at to advance the interests of Christ in the earth. Number three, another channel of serving God. Number three, financial and material resource investment in God's work. Financial and material resource investment in the work of God. I think this is simpler and straightforward. Thank God for what we have been doing in this area over the years to promote the work of God, but I believe there is more we must do. And those that gave in support of the work of God, the Bible says they did it once and again. They did it once and again. <laughs> they did it once and again. That is, they did it continually. They did it tirelessly. You remember, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. It says we must not be weary in doing good. Mm. That is, good must be done continually. So financial and resource investment in the work of God is a good thing to do. And we must never be tired of doing that which is good. In um, Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, Philippians chapter 4. It says, give it to me in... Uh, Let's say good news translation. You Philippians know very well that when I was left or when I left Macedonia in the early days of preaching the good news, you were the only church to help me. You were the only ones who shared my profits and losses. <laughs> More than once, when I needed help in Thessalonica, you sent it to me. More than once, sir. Huh? More than once. NIV of verse 16, Philippians 4. Hmm. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again. Oh my God. And again. Again and again. Again and again. That is how to invest in this kingdom, sir. Again and again, continually. Continually. Don't say, I did it last time. I can't do it anymore. No, sir. No, sir. As long as God continues to supply continually oxygen in your direction, you must supply continually resources into his kingdom. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 3, New Living Translation. Luke 8 verse 3. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing their own resources to support 
Jesus and his disciples. Mm -hmm. Now, these are women and many others who understood why God had put resources in their hands. They said it is not just for our enjoyment. It is also for the advancement of kingdom agenda. It's not just for our enjoyment, but also for the advancement of the agenda of the kingdom of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. We've talked severally about 1 Chronicles 29 verses 1 to 9. 1 Chronicles 29 verses 1 to 9, New Living Translation. Then King David turned to the entire assembly and said, My son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. The work ahead of him is enormous. For the temple he will build is not for mere mortals. It is for the Lord God himself. Using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for building the temple of my God. Now, there is enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, and wood, as well as great quantities of onyx, other precious stones, costly jewels, and all kinds of fine stone and marble. And now, because of my personal devotion, yes, to the temple of my God, I am giving all of my own private treasures mm -hmm, of gold and silver to help in the construction. Beloved, you must help in the construction. Like we are constructing here. Help in the construction. What is your contribution so far to the construction of the temple of God? To the construction works that are happening in these premises. What has been your contribution so far? You can do more and you can do better. You can do more and you can do better. The work is not completed yet. Therefore, don't stop giving. Don't stop contributing. Verse number four. He says... I am donating more than 112 tons of gold. That is more than 112,000 kgs of gold. And 262 tons of refined silver to be used for overlaying the walls of the buildings. Verse number five. And for the other gold and silver work to be done by the craftsmen. Now then. Who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? He is talking to the people. <laughs> Verse number six. Then the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals and captains of the army, and the king's administrative officers all gave willingly. Mm. For the construction of the temple of God, they gave about 188 tons of gold. Mm. Ten tons. 1,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. These are thousands of kgs in treasure. They also contributed numerous precious stones which were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord under the care of Jehiel a descendant of Gershon. Verse number nine. The people rejoiced over the offerings for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord and King David was filled with joy. How many pastors are filled with joy today at the giving of the people? Most of them are filled with pressure. <laughs> Why are the people not giving now? <laughs> And people employ all kinds of tricks. People enter into what they call giving competition. People of this area have given more. Now, how about of this area? <laughs> Why are 
churches going into games? It's because people are not willing to give. But I understood from the word of God that I don't have to do that. Because when God called me to start this work, that uh, scripture that I read with you is very important for me. Oh, that Exodus 31, very crucial. Because that's the one God gave me. Ask my wife. That's what I told her. I said, to beg, I am ashamed. Who is going to support this work? He said, I will raise the Bezalels and the Holy Abs. Yes. He said, I will raise the Bezalels to do this work. And you are part of those Bezalels. <laughs> By divine privilege. By divine privilege. So I said, on this basis, there will be no tricks to make people give. No tricks. That is why we even give you envelope. So that if you are stingy, you manifest it privately. You are generous, you manifest it privately. <laughs> Nobody is going to push you for anything. Nobody receives a private call from me in this stage. They say, eh, we are banking on you. Never. Because it's not my work, it's the work of God. So I will not carry burdens for somebody's work. Somebody asked me, with all these projects, Pastor, do you sleep? I said, a lot. Ask my wife if you don't believe. I sleep a lot. <laughs> I'm not worried. I said, about what? Is it my work? It's the work of God. It is called what? The work of God. The church is called the church of who? Esa Obanda? No, sir. It is the church of God. So don't misbehave in the church because you are saying it is his church. You know, people ask me, where is your church? Do I have a church? Where is your church? Do I own one? <laughs> I don't own church. It's the church of Jesus. Is it making sense? And anything good you are doing towards that work, you are doing it toward Jesus. Mm. You know, Saul was persecuting the believers. You remember? That is why he even went to Damascus. Acts chapter 9. Give me verse number 1. That is why he even went to Damascus. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats. Okay, let's get back to New King James Version. And Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Ah, he was murdering who? Ah, who was he threatening? The disciples of who? Of the Lord. As he journeyed, sorry, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and held a voice saying to him, so, so, why are you persecuting me? Ah, Jesus, when did I persecute you? Is it making sense? Now, when you do something for the, for the believer or against the believer, you are doing it unto Jesus. Is it making sense? Because the disciples are of the Lord and the church, like this church, belongs to who? To the Lord himself. So if you are doing anything, for example, you are in the choir, in this church, you are singing for the Lord. Not for the pastor. I'm also just a worker in the house of the Lord. The honor of the work is Jesus himself. We must all honor him, respect him, and revere him. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And so it should delight you to invest your resources in his work. And the good news is that God will never despise your offering. If you give it wholeheartedly and cheerfully. If you give it cheerfully, generously, he will never despise it. That now, he is not driven by amounts per se. He is driven by the heart. How are you giving? How are you giving? He will never despise it if you give it rightly. 
regardless of the value, if you give it rightly, he's going to be happy with you. Somebody shout hallelujah. All right. Let's go to number four, which is the last one. Number four. I'm showing you channels of serving God. Number one, carrying out the work of evangelism. Number two, spiritual gifts and talents utilization in the promotion of the work of God. Number three, financial and material resources investment in God's work. Number four, here it is, engaging in targeted fruit-bearing endeavors in his church. I'll explain that in a moment. Engaging in targeted fruit-bearing endeavors or undertakings in his church. Engaging in targeted fruit-bearing endeavors in his church. We see in the word of God that he wants us to bear fruits, isn't it? God wants us to bear fruits. John 15, 16, for example. John 15 and verse number 16. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and what? Bear fruit. Bear fruit. And one of the practical ways of doing this is to engage in targeted fruit bearing activities on a monthly basis. Engage in targeted fruit bearing activities, fruit bearing endeavors on regular basis. In Revelation 22 verses 1 to 2, Revelation 22 verses 1 to 2, let's do this quickly please. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 2. In the middle of his street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, here it is, which bore 12 fruits. Each tree yielding is fruit every month. Have you seen that, sir? Yes. So, one of the ways you can serve God is to bear fruits every month, engaging in targeted fruit bearing activities every month. Targeted. Targeted. Some of us go through the month without doing anything specific for God. So you can't even remember what specific thing you did for Jesus in January, for example. <laughs> Never. Because there's nothing. You have no agenda at all. You are just floating. Like a boat in water. Driven by the wind to and fro. Anyhow. So you can say, for example, that I will be winning a soul to Jesus every month, at least a soul. That is targeted fruit-bearing endeavor. You are saying every blessed month, I will be talking to someone, to Jesus, and I will make sure that that person receives Jesus as Lord and personal Savior. So you can point at something that in January, I won a soul to Christ. Is it making sense? Or somebody may say, I know that the church is involved in so many activities. And for example, uh, they need water all the time. So this month, I'll buy a crate of water for the church. It's specific. I'm not talking about tithing. Everyone must tithe. Just like everyone must breathe. Can you say breathing is your achievement? They say, brother, what have you achieved in life? Um, number one, breathing. <laughs> number two, going to the toilet. Are those achievements? Now, if you are alive, you must breathe. If you are alive, you must go where, sir? To the toilet. So it's the same. If you're a Christian, you must die. If you're a 
are a Christian, you must be found in the house of God. So you can't say, no, you know, this month I attended all services. Ah, uh -uh. is that an achievement? So you have something targeted, not something general. Please, I'm not talking about generalities. I'm talking about specifics. This month, I'm buying water for the church. Okay, next month, no, it's not water. I'm going to contribute an amount for live streaming expenses of our services. Specific. Specific. Okay. This month, I'm going to buy 10 bags of cement as my contribution for this month towards construction works. That's a fruit-bearing believer. Not who is just you know, moving in generalities. So you can't tell, for example, April, what specific thing did you do for God? Uh, no, at least I tried to attend all the services. Uh, what a joke. What a joke. What a joke. What a joke. Okay, this month... Aside the fasting programs of the church, I will be on seven day prayer and fasting for my pastor. Hmm? So nobody knows, nobody is aware. It, it is you. You want to be, this month is a prayer. I feel like I should. Now, I will go to the mountain this month, every Saturday, throughout the month, I will be in the mountain the whole day to pray for my pastor. You are bearing fruits. Is it making sense? There is something specific and targeted that you are doing to bear fruits. Mm. Rise on your feet. So every month, look for something specific that you can do in the house of God. Have something in mind to do in God's house. Find something to do in the Lord's house. Look for opportunities to give. Look for opportunities to give. Every month you must engage in some kingdom advancement projects in the church. Always ask yourself, what difference can I make in the church this month? There is something I did last month. Now, you may not, or God may not even want you to do the same thing the following month. So you say, what must I do in the church this month? And it is not anything difficult. It's not anything difficult. It's not anything difficult. And just to let you know also, not to let you know, but to remind you, because I believe we've said this before, that we have a scholarship fund. It is called PICC Scholarship Fund. So by design, we started sponsoring children from preschool. I will not tell you the number. These are children of people that cannot afford to send their child to a school like the one we sent them to. And their children now are speaking English to parents that don't understand anything about English. I want you to think about what you can contribute to this fund. Because we pay several millions every term, something like we pay several millions or thereabout. I want you to think about what you can contribute. I know some of you, you are thinking about how you can benefit. Everyone wants to be on the receiving side. No one wants to be on the giving side. Be on the giving side. Does it make sense? Be on the giving side. 
give something towards the PICC scholarship fund. You're on ground online, you're hearing me, please do something. If you're watching online, there's a number on your screen that you can use to contact us so we give you more details about this scholarship fund. Everyone who is willing can participate and no amount is small. It can be a thousand. If you, you don't have enough to send somebody to school, please team up with others. That is what this fund is about. Here a little, there a little, we put our resources together, someone can go to school. Is it making sense? Come on, I want you to pray and say, Lord, give me grace to serve you like never before. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Give me grace to serve you like never before. Father, we give you praise. We worship, exalt, and bless you. We thank you for your goodness. We celebrate you, Lord. We worship you, King of Kings. We thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for the privilege of service. We bless you, Lord of glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. If we are all born again, we must all serve in the various ways and capacities that we have discussed. And please, you must understand that serving God is a privilege. What is it? It's a privilege. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12. Serving God is a privilege. It is a privilege. And everyone must maximize this privilege. Lift your two hands. Now may the Lord bless you in the name of Jesus. May he give you peace, success and prosperity. Open doors on every side. Increase and multiplication. In the mighty name of Jesus. Grace to serve God is resting upon your life. And as you serve him, may he bless your water and your bread in the name of Jesus. None among us shall be barren in the name of Jesus. None among us shall suffer miscarriages in the name of Jesus. Each one of us shall be fruitful in the name of Jesus. We shall multiply. I said we shall multiply. Divine multiplication in all dimensions of life. Receive it in the name of Jesus. May this week present you with all kinds of pleasant testimonies in the name of Jesus. It is your week of divine connections, divine health, divine favor, divine prosperity, divine promotions, divine provisions in the mighty name of Jesus. Please, you believe that, shout it louder. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 23 and verse number 6 Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.